Dr. Stephen Cate spent 24 years as the Chief Economist for the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He has also worked for the Productivity Commission. He is currently a senior lecturer at the School of Economics, Finance and Marketing at RMIT University. Most of his research has been into macroeconomic policy, industrial relations and the history of economic thought. His most extensive area of expertise is in the classical propositions surrounding Say's law, on which he has written many papers as well as two books. He completed his honors degree in economics at Toronto University his master's at the University of Western Ontario, and his PhD at La Trobe University. A recent book of his is titled Free Market Economics, an Introduction for the General Reader. Today he will be speaking about the English classical tradition and Austrian economics and where they're the same and where they differ. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cates. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid old age wrecks everything, whatever I've had. Um, anyways, I, I, I'm here to do a paper on, present a paper on the English tr classical tradition. Um, I always have to apologize for the fact that I'm not an Austrian when I speak to Austrian audiences, but I ended up coming to many, mostly all of the same conclusions, but from a different direction. So I actually started with John Stuart Mill, worked outwards in the English classical tradition, and it is interesting to me because there are interesting differences that come from coming through the English classical tradition rather than the Austrian tradition, which is what I would like to talk about today. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, just to give you the framework of the talk, I, I'll give you the, uh, the three emails, part of the emails that I exchanged with Secrete when, I, when, when he wrote to me about doing this presentation here. And the first thing I said to him, look, I'm, I'm not an Austrian. I said, look, there are no economists I hold in higher regard than Mises and Hayek, and I'm, for all that, not really an Austrian economist. I describe myself as classical and put myself somewhere in the camp of John Stuart Mill and Alfred Marshall. Most importantly for placing me in some kind of scheme of things, um, I am un-Keynesian and anti-Keynesian but like I say, he would have known that already, and that is really what making putting me into the classical tradition. But you see, what, what, what was interesting to me is that I, I've always said this, kind of like half of a joke, I'm not neoclassical, I'm not Austrian, I'm not. so I would say I'm classical, but I thought, you know, maybe I should just find out how much it actually is true that I'm a classical. Um, anyway, so what I wrote to him was this is a subsequent email, I said, look, I'd like to do a paper on the differences and similarities between the English classical tradition and the Austrian economics. I am from the first group, and while there are as an almost total overlap, they are not the same. I'm useful to see the differences, and that is what I intend to discuss. Therefore, my title, and I was suggesting my title, which is the English classical tradition and Austrian economics, where they are the same and where they differ. And then there was this. So I thought about, well, what am I going to talk to about? Like, like, I just sit down right off the top of my head, what are the differences I know of? Um, and um, so this was months ago before I started on this trek. And, um, and I said, look, well, it was clear that the role of government seems to be a difference. And that was certainly underscored yesterday. Um, the use of aggregation. Um, then there's something called roundaboutness in production, which is very important in uh, the Austrian tradition, not so important in English. And then there's something called Say's Law, which is secret said is. But in the, as I say in the final analysis, perhaps I don't understand Austrian economics well enough. That's always a, that is a genuine possibility. Although I will say in my defense, I've read plenty of it. And I mean I have read plenty in, in, in the Austrian tradition. Um, but just to give you my creds on saying I really am Austrian <clears throat> at heart, I, back in 2000 and, <clears throat> and not, and sorry, well, 1999, Christmas Day almost, I was, writing a, um, I was writing a column at those times in the Canberra Times, so I had a weekly column, and I wrote the 10 most, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, <coughs> pardon me. 
the ten most in this will always every time I say the name Keynes, this happens to me. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyway, so the 10 most influential economists of the 20th century, and it was at the last sort of day of the 20th century, and I use the word influential because you have to put them up there, but I didn't want to say the best or anything along those lines. I just want to have him at the top because he was the most influential. And I said, look, far and away the cent century's most influential economists, but I'm saying it should not be thought, I believe, the influence of having been for the good. Until the publication of the General Theory in 1930, it was well understood that public spending dragged the economy down. Now, I'm writing this in 1999. Now, the present evidence makes it overwhelming. This is just simply straightforward thinking through the classical tradition, um, dragging the economy down rod and propping it up. It will be well into the next century before his destructive influence will have finally disappeared. And um, it will be well into, but at least we are starting on the process now. But then I had two and three. Number two, and rather than going into um, the negative side, I was now into the positive side. Friedrich Hayek is the economist of choice for those nations who have lived under communism these past 50 years. His name today is virtually unknown in the West. I still think that's more or less true. Um, but within these economies trying to resurrect free markets, his is the guidance most frequently sought. His road to serfdom is beloved by anyone who treasures political freedom. Um, and of course, the constitutional liberty as well. Um, and then I had Ludwig von Mises as my number three as the most influential economist of the 20th century. And Ludwig von Mises took the fight up to the socialist dogmas of the early 20th century and showed on paper that no economy could ever solve the problems of allocating resources without a price mechanism, free markets, and private property. Who doesn't know it now? He knew it 80 years ago. And in fact, it's because of what he knew and how obvious and logical what he said was, that this, these ideas are now, I wouldn't quite call it commonplace, but they are now certainly widely understood and, 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 and even within economists of all traditions there is a definite recognition that the things that Mises said all those, now it's 90 years ago, um, are, are, are valid and important and essential to understand how to make an economy work. Anyway, so that I, I, I want to just demonstrate that I, even though I'm going to say I'm the classical tradition, I am not in any way other, anything other than with the highest regard for, for, the, for, the, for the Austrian tradition itself. <clears throat> now, in thinking about this, I thought, well, you know, um, what, is it, what does it mean that I'm a, a classical economist? And I, so I stopped, sat back and thought, well, look, let me, let me just go and think about this. I mean, and to be a classical economist puts me in a certain division, some, some kind of time frame, some kind of, of, of framework. Where is it? How is it? So, so first of all, I thought, well, there is this dark age. Economics had this dark age. It's from caveman time to 1776. And in 1776, Adam Smith publishes his Wealth of Nations. Um, and he brings really into view, into common consciousness, the fact that there is this thing called a market. That up until then, economies were thought of as sort of like, even though it's a very large, very large expanse of England, France, whatever, it was still like a farm. You got the king, and you got his, everybody got his farm hands who were called barons and earls and dukes. But the, it was run from the top down. And in that way, things would, be, would, 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 would evolve, you know, like you'd have it that way. And so the whole direction, what, 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 what Adam Smith called mercantilism, but it was really just a top-down form of how to manage your economy. And then Adam Smith writes this book. And what he does is he sort of, he brings in the notion, you know, nobody has to run an economy. It's a really incredible thing. Thing this thing on the con it runs itself. It just runs itself. It just sort of leave it alone. It'll just work. You don't do anything. And it's kind of like this 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 new idea in the world that turns out to be not only true but so true that that anybody who's adopted 
Adam Smith. You don't have to go even one minute past that. Just adopt Adam Smith. You suddenly have an economy that blossoms. It is the single most influential book ever written for good, I think, in the history of the human race. It's just an extraordinarily important book. Um, but that's whose tradition I'm in. Anyways, I just, all this fine print here, but look, there are three eras. Three eras, I say. <coughs> Not errors, eras, periods. And there's three stages. So look, I say this is a classical, this is mine. Um, it took a look, thought about, because you began, you know, we we're, we're had this kind of like farm concept. Well, everybody's going to run it by the top down, and everybody will run it, and, 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 and no. And he said, look, you know, the whole idea of stage one is to withdraw government. There is this huge amount of government influence. It's extraordinary. It's monstrous. And what the classical economists, you go from Adam Smith and you go through to um, Ricardo and you know James Mill, John Stuart Mill, all of them, what they were trying to do is peel back as much as possible to the maximum extent possible, they peel back the influence of governments. Now that's, that is the essence of it. That is what the invisible hand's about. You don't need this government there. It's actually a fifth wheel. It's a mistake. Get rid of it. Push it back as much as possible. And the economics of that stage one era, that, that classical era, was one of expanding freedom, expanding just not just economic freedom, political freedom. And, and the idea there is that you didn't need a heavy-handed government. It was not only an unnecessary, it was an encumbrance. And then you move into stage two. And this is a funny thing. This is, this is what you'd call your neoclassical period, your, your, where the Austrian economics sort of blossoms. <clears throat> and it comes with something in economics called the marginal revolution. And the marginal revolution is kind of <coughs> Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for it, but the essence of it is we stop thinking about economies from above. We stop looking up, down, looking down, and what we do instead is we sort of think, you know, we don't need this kind of national view, which is what the classical view is. It's a kind of a national look across the world view. We'll just go down and just have the, the, the economics of the individual. And it takes economics from, from being what it had been in the classical tradition, which is the view of the world, to one in which individuals make up um, all the decisions by themselves. Institutional arrangements are sort of background. Um, thinking about government involvement, background. Um, and so you end up with a... Um, um, not only do you end up with this kind of individual, but if you understand the marginal revolution, you even lose something called the supply side of the economy because of this thing called marginal utility. That is what the driver was. And marginal utility was a personal thing, it was an individual thing. And the supply side of the economy, strangely enough, goes into the background. Having been primary, virtually all of it, in the classical era, it becomes secondary and hidden and diminished. In, the, in, the, um, in, the, in that middle marginal area. And then in 1936, you have the next, this huge change, which is now the change now. And you call it the Keynesian Revolution, but it's, the Keynesian Revolution is more than just the macro. <clears throat> it is about what governments should do. I mean, we'd been moving sort of towards that, towards that, towards that, but very incrementally, very slowly, and then shebang. And it's the Keynesian Revolution brings the government at every point. If there's a problem, the government can solve it. If there's unemployment, the government can solve it. If there's a smoking problem, the government can solve it. Everything is a government solution. And that is the era we now live in. Now, I don't think of myself as, e as certainly not in stage three. I don't think of myself even in stage two. What I want to put to you today is that even for yourselves, you should think about that stage one. And it is the Losing the traditional stage one is one of the great tragedies of both the economic side and the political side. <clears throat> um, now, 
Say's law. You know, it's it's to an economist, actually to everybody. It's just so if you heard of it at all, it has this quaint historical feel. Um, but within the within that stage one, that classical tradition, there was something ex there. It wasn't named Say's law. The name Say's law doesn't actually get invented till the 1920s. The very fact that Keynes knows the name Say's law means that he's reading things that are written by the Americans in the 1920s, but you know what? He never tells anybody what he's reading. But he must be reading it because he uses this term that comes from the 1920s, not at all classical, not at all. But, with it, but it is, it does have a meaning. And with better within the stage one and explicit on the stage two, um, is an element of economic theory that was the essence of the theory of the business cycle, and it was based on Say's Law. And here is a letter written by the great economist David Ricardo in 1821, and he's writing to his mate um, um, Thomas Robert Malthus, who has just written a book that says, you know what? The problem with economies is that there's not enough demand. That's why we don't have we have why we have recessions. There's not enough demand. Now it so happens that Keynes reads Malthus's correspondence with Ricardo in 1932, and he brings Malthus back. That's what happens. He brings Malthus back from the dead, the zombie, completely gone. And in 1936, he resurrects this completely dead economist who was. Thomas Robert Malthus, and but this is what, 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 Ricardo writes to him in his private letter. The letter isn't even available for a hundred years. The letters get lost. Are finally rediscovered in 1930 by Schraffa, who is Keynes' best friend, which is why Keynes reads the stuff, and he says, "Look, men err in their productions. There is no deficiency of demand." Hello. This is two things. This is all you need to know about the theory. That everything else is just an expansion on that. They were saying, because Mouth is saying, "Oh, look, you know, it's all deficient demand." He says, "No, it's not. It is never deficient demand. It is never that. It is always something to do with um, the fact that people make mistakes. You know, your engine is running along, and then it gets the timing goes bad. You know, so you got to resurrect it." It is never the fact that your economy is slowing down because there's not enough things for people to buy. Um, now I take you back to classical economic theory. And I just, you may not be able to read the print, but look. Um, it's an issue here about aggregates. And national economic prosperity was consideration of the interplay of economic aggregates. Aggregates were not a poison to the, uh, to the classical economists. Now, I don't happen to like land, labor, capital as the, as the particular aggregates they use, but it's just the notion that there were aggregates. There were aggregate, ag aggregatable group, groupings that could be used to make some sense. Um, the major aim of policy was to limit to the greatest extent possible the role of government in directing economic activity. Um, it is the red thread, or the blue thread, that goes through Adam Smith and all the others, and Ricardo, you know, the free trade and uh, no protection and open borders for, 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 for goods and services and all that. It is a basic philosophy. People should just be able to move and do what they like with their economic possibilities, and then they will, and then the, it will turn out to be the best for all of us. As a, um, the invisible hand. Um, we, if there is anything that now, I mean, just dominates economic, it is very much the visible hand of government. Um, and we, and what I write about and I've written about is the fact that economics is no longer what it once was. That stage three ideas. It's no longer get government out. What economics now is as a subject the way it's taught, pick up any textbook. It's a handbook for governments on how to fix every imaginable problem under the sun. You go name a problem, there's, a, there's an economic solution that requires yet another public servant to, with another public servant, uh, with another department or another piece of legislation. The 
economics has stopped being what it was in stage one. And even though it lives on that reputation of Adam Smith and the rest, it is not that anymore. It is now a handbook for government interference at every point in the economy to try to do good because there is this view that economy just left to itself, and this is a textbook now, economy just left to itself, will simply run into problems and create enormous harm. And if you cannot allow the economy just to simply run on its own. And then the last one is this theory of the cycle based on Say's law. And if you understand Say's law, then you would understand, as I did in 1999, as I did in 2009, public spending will never, can never, cannot possibly get you recovery. What increased public spending and recession will do, will do everything you see in the United States, across Europe, now in Australia, coming to China, it will just harm you. And it is this embedded notion of Say's Law that every classical economist knew and every neoclassical, it went into stage two. The, the person who carried the, 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 the marginal revolution into the English world was, was, was an economist named Stanley Jevons. And he hated Mill. He hated everything about the way that macro was done, the way economics was done. But the only part that he includes in his principles of political economy explicitly is a recognition that Mill was right about Say's law. And that just comes across, it goes in, comes across, it goes into the classical tradition, neoclassical tradition, so the Austrian tradition, it's there. Um, um, but here you have your marginal revolution. It's put on the individual. It diminished the role of the supply side, a very large problem. Um, Economics was oriented around microeconomic issues, marginal utility, marginal this, marginal that. Um, to pursue the necessary aspects for dealing with the recessions, there was suddenly an explicit part of economic theory called the theory of the cycle. It hadn't existed before. It's quite interesting. There is no such thing as a separate theory of the cycle. Why not? Because what became the theory of the cycle was basically the economics of my classical tradition. That's what it was. How do you get growth? How do you keep governments out? What would cause recessions? What would make economy? So that it becomes a separate part. And it's kind of, to me, sad that we, that, that, and it's almost lost as a separate part. It's up there, but it's not seen as the middle of it, not in the mainstream the way it was in the classical tradition. Um, now here is Mark Skousen, a great Austrian economist who's written the best history of economics. If you want to read a great history of economics, read Mark Skousen. Um, he, he, just to, just, just, just to, um, to make it a bit more interesting, he, it's, he does this kind of like, I don't think he'd know, I'm sure it was on, on, on purpose, but it's partly he tells you the story of all these economists. And then he tells you about their love lives. <laughs> it just sort of keeps you in. But anyways, um, what he says here, and he talks about the marginalists, argue that in the long run there is no such thing as an independent supply curve. And this is true. I was taught this. This is just how I was taught. Um, supply is ultimately determined by final demand. The Austrians indicate that cost is nothing more than foregone alternatives. And so you lost the notion of supply, the most important part of that stage one classical tradition just got disappeared. And then, of course, you end up with the Keynesian revolution, a desire for higher levels of public involvement in directing the economy. That's it there, every stage. Roosevelt is, the, is the, the paradigm example of everybody following after them. An explicit and strident rejection of Say's law. Um, the explicit introduction of something called aggregate demand. Aggregate demand as the great driving force of the economy. Economic theory divided into two distinct halves, micro and macro. Um, one deals with recessions and unemployment. The other one deals with the allocation of resources and um, competing ends. What is described as Austrian? You just go to the economic side. Is a theory that was the contemporary rival of Keynes in the general theory, but it wasn't. It wasn't Austrian in those days. It was just called economics. It was, there was an Austrian version that, that, that had a kind of 
tradition that came out of Umbawerk and Menger and others from the Austria. But there was a huge other tradition that came out of the English tradition, you know, my John Stuart Mill and Alfred Marshall, whatever. There was this tremendous tradition. And there was an American version of that, um, um, Eli and uh, um, Alan Young, and, but there are many, many economists in that. The interesting thing um, is that what happens um, is that only one strand of that great, huge stage two tradition makes it down to the 21st century. And it is the Austrian tradition. It is not, Austrian economics was not simply on its own. In fact, if you read uh, what happens in the 30s, Hayek, who's living in London and at the LSE, he's promoted by Lionel Robbins as the opposite and the answer to Keynes. It's not that there was this Austrian tradition over there in Vienna. There was a tradition called economics that Keynesian economics was about to completely destroy. Um, as I see it, it's individualist, it's demand side, it's stage two, it's structurally embedded in marginal analysis, a strictly limited role for government, so it keeps the stage one tradition, a theory of the cycle, built around monetary equilibrium supply side considerations. The role of the differences with Austrian perspective, okay? Role of government, use of aggregation, roundaboutness, the cause of recession to cure, the importance of Say's law. Might I just mention? <laughs> um, but, but I do say this, it is, and to my great, great surprise, it is the only anti-Keynesian book published since the GFC. I don't know of any others, and certainly it, and it tells you, and it's called the Free Market Economics, and it's about, and it's, even though I use it as a teaching tool, I use it in my course, it was written that way because I was wrote it, so I said to my students, I'm going to write this book from scratch, and I did it in the first semester in 2009, um, but the whole point of it is just as a narrative. My students note it to me, you know, they, they say, oh, you know, you just read it, you know, it's not like a book, it doesn't. It's not didactic in that way, but it tells you the story of how economic economies work from a stage one, from that great English classical tradition. Um, ah, okay, what does it say? All this fine print, just quickly. Governments can be expected frequently, uh, there are governments um, which can be expected frequently to intervene in the economy. There are individuals who run businesses they are profoundly shaped by government decisions, good or bad, usually bad. Um, they're individuals who are in incomes, produce goods. Um, they use those incomes to buy things. Um, things that work out best if they're entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, you never see that word in, in, in a normal textbook anymore. There are entrepreneurs, they go and try to find what other people want to buy. Um, there are things governments can do, but they are limited, and they, you run out of useful things government can do very early on in government spending. Um, um, Supply-side supply oriented, focus on the entrepreneurial drive of activity, ignores disdains. You know, this marginal revenue equals marginal cost. I tell my students, because many of them have a grad, teach a graduate course, I say to them, if you write down marginal revenue equals marginal cost in your test paper, I will fail that question uh, automatically. I tell them it is not what it means. Don't use it. Um, and of course it depends on Say's law. Role of government. Um, this, this is about government. It just assumes there is a government. There's going to be one out there. It also says, oh look, Whatever, you, whatever kind of government you are, you're the government of China, you're the government of Iraq, you're the government of Australia, you're the government of the United States, look, do you want to have economic growth, prosperity, full employment, low inflation, da 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 da? This will tell you how to do it. It's just recognize that there's going to be government. End the story. Um, um, it's different, certainly, from the way governments were described yesterday, certainly the way I think of governments. Governments are there. Um, in many ways, when I, when I listened yesterday, it was not an economic discussion. It was a political, political theory discussion, political philosophy discussion. That's different. Um, um, political principle, Keynesian economics, whether Keynesian, you know, suppose Keynesian economics would work. Suppose if you actually had public spending and it would just cause your economy to blossom. Well, you know, it would be very hard to argue against it. 
I mean, there are arguments you might use. You'd say, even though it'll keep me poor, I don't want the government there. What I say, this fact, is that you don't want government spending because it actually makes your economy worse off. It creates unemployment. But, 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 but that's the difference, you see. To me, it just, it's just a matter of expediency. Does it work? No. It doesn't work. Don't do it. Um, aggregation. Well, you know, I'm, I don't have a problem with aggregation as such. Aggregation is part of what you need to do if you're going to talk about things in, in economies. There is only one part of aggregation that, yeah, is the aggregate demand. That I give you this by free advice, <laughs> I think I thought by students. If you use the words aggregate demand to make, to, for as any part of any explanation for anything that's going on in the economy, you are on, automatically and certain to be wrong. If you say aggregate demand, that the problem with the economy is not enough demand or anything like that, you're wrong. You'll never get it right. You'll never understand what's going on. But it's not that I don't like aggregates. It's just that aggregate demand happens to be understood in the classical tradition is aggregate supply. They are not separate. You cannot demand what you can't don't supply. Aggregate demand not equals to is, is aggregate supply. So there you don't have the separate aggregate thing here called aggregate demand, but you do have something called a total level of output. <clears throat> I don't know what roundabout is. I've never made, it just seems like to me capital intensive. I don't have any problem with capital intensity. I've never understood the, what the issue is, but some can explain it to me. Um, cause of recession in an Austrian tradition to me are too narrow. Um, what causes a, a recession to me is going back to Ricardo. You know, men, err in their, men err in their productions. They make mistakes. And it doesn't have to be a monetary phenomenon. Many, many reasons that are non-monetary. The oil, the oil shock of the 1970s, which caused all our economies to melt down. Um, the, the, the housing mortgage, it wasn't a monetary phenomenon so much as a big, bad decision. Governments forcing um, banks to lend money to people who could never repay it. So it wasn't monetary in that sort of way, where bad use of monetary policy, and loose mon it was different. Um, many, many reasons for recession, they are not, they are not um, um, covered totally. Um, in a classical theory recession, um, that if there's lots of things that will cause uh, an economy to misfire, just go in the wrong direction. All these various maladjustments, you know, like I say, like a timing in a car engine in the old days, it just goes out. And things happen, you've got to retune it. And then, then, but with the economy, you retune them by just leaving alone, <laughs> they'll fix themselves. It's quite an extraordinary thing, fixing them. As you know, the 1929-30, they tried to fix a, a less worse recession that existed in 1921-1922 in the United States. Harding went fishing. Hoover and Roosevelt just bought in, bought in, fixed, 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 created the Great Depression. Um, <clears throat> is demand efficiency possible? Well, this is the big issue to me. This is, this is the big issue, you know. This is the one that a whole world, they roll the dice over this Keynesian stuff. Is demand deficiency possible? Yes, says Keynes, possible. Recessions are caused by too little demand because people choose to save instead. So what's the answer? You spend money. But this is the classical, my first stage, and part of stage two, my first stage answer. No, it is not possible. For recession is a result of problems of structure, of supply relative to structure demand, and where what is produced does not match what those with income wish to buy. And that's Say's Law. Um, anyway, Say's Law was the foundation of the principle of classical theory, accepted by everybody across the time. One of the bedrock principles used to say in the form that overproduction was impossible, although demand efficiency as a form of words was used, as, as Ricardo said. Only weakly accepted. This is the thing. You know, there is an article that Hayek writes in 1931 in which he invokes Say's Law in arguing against two crackpot American economists who were, who were, who were dealing with demand efficiency, trying to say that that was the problem. Um, but he doesn't go back to that. Mises doesn't go back to it. He says, yes, it's, 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 it's an issue, but minor. He doesn't go back to it in the centrality the way I think it needs to be gone back to. Um, General glut debates, come back to Ricardo, men air in the production, no deficiency demand. It's not part of the Austrian tradition, and that's what I think it should be. What I, I, I spoke to the Mises Institute in Auburn two years ago, and that's I spoke about Say's Law, and that's what I tried to tell them then. It's the same thing I try to tell you now. 
that what you must do in the Austrian tradition is reintroduce the notion of Say's law and, 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 and Ricardo's principle, men err in the productions, there is no deficiency of demand. Thank you. <clears throat>
whatever you think of having a central banker, we have one who thinks in that exactly that same way. He thinks in a Vixellian model. We were the first economy after the GFC to raise interest rates. We have persistently kept interest rates up. The reason they do that is because he doesn't think in terms of lower interest rates will expand your economy. He actually thinks of lower interest rates as a, as a, as a, as a problem. And he thinks higher interest rates in exactly the same way is the only answer to making sure that our savings are used in a productive, efficient way. Again, yes, yes, there exist central bankers uh, that are slightly wiser and central bankers that are slightly uh, less wise. It doesn't uh, change the fact that central banks in and of itself are a tremendous danger. Um, uh, you see, it is almost, it's almost the same. People sometimes ask me, you, you compare government with a criminal organization, how can you say that there are very important differences between the United States, let's say, and the former Soviet Union? And then my answer to these things is, yes, of course there are. There are gangsters, they are worse, and there are gangsters that are not quite as bad. The okay. example I always give, a friend of mine went to an ATM machine, got some money out of the ATM machine, and the mugger was standing behind him and said, hand over the 500 euros to me. And then my friend started negotiating with this guy and said, look, it is late at night, I want to have a few beers, can you just give me some of the money back? And the gangster was a nice gangster. He gave him 50 bucks, 50 euros back. Of the, um, so um, you can, of course, also encounter gangsters that then, uh, after starting negotiating with them, they kick your teeth in and break your kneecaps. Um, so yes, there are some central banks that follow a more wise policy and others that follow a less wise policy, but nonetheless, they are all heads of a criminal organization. That is the point that I'm trying to make. Very quick comment on the two comments that have been made with respect to Citigroup and the CEO. Uh, we have to keep dancing. That's much of a Nuremberg defense. If the Nuremberg defense was not accepted at Nuremberg, if it's not accepted today yeah. at the International Criminal Court, by what possible logic can be accepted uh, in finance and banking circles? Right. With respect to the other comment, um, well, a horse that can count to three is a remarkable horse, not a remarkable mathematician. A central banker <laughs> who has knowledge of Wixel um, is likely a remarkable central banker, but should not be confused with someone who is prescient and somehow knows what the time preference of the general public is and somehow can set an overnight cash rate amazingly, miraculously, to equivalent uh, market interest rates with um, uh, a natural rate of interest. He might do so out of sheer luck, but it seems to me the logic which has been presented to us is that that's going to be a one-off, that's going to be sheer luck, and in the medium term, a disaster is a far more likely result than sheer luck. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll, I'll keep that horse example in mind for future reference. <laughs> <laughs>